Okay, good morning. We are in Genesis part four. This is lesson three B. We're calling it A and B because we have broken down lessons three and four into two different uh, studies so that everybody would have more time to get some of those observations done in the chapters. Um, I would, I personally felt like even th because we had a holiday, we had two weeks to do this part B, and thank goodness, right? It was like a, a lot. I mean, of course, obviously, I feel like maybe when you're given more time, you do more, and I do think that is true. We, we do more when we're given more time, or we procrastinate more, whichever. <laughs> but these are rich, rich chapters. Tell me your, your, before we dig into the details of it, tell me your impressions on the whole of what we have been looking at concerning who is God, who is man, and what are these storylines revealing to you personally at this point? Oh, too deep of a thought, too early? Uh, faithfulness. <laughs> God's faithfulness, yeah. He, he, you know, he said to uh, Jacob that where you go, I will go with you, and I will be with you, and, and I will bring you back to this place. And so we're on the brink of him doing that very thing. How many years later? 27 years later. 27 years. That's a long time. Uh, do you think Jacob thought he would be gone that long? No. Do you think, you know, I'm curious. Um, I'm, I'm, it's like watching a soap opera uh, or, or a TV series, not a soap opera, but a TV series, it almost is a soap opera, <laughs> but a TV series, you know, and you get one segment, and then you get the next, uh, and you almost can't wait to get to the next one. Okay, now what's going to happen next? Yeah. We all kind of know what's going to happen next, but have you found that doing this inductively like this changes or has changed your perspective on the storylines? In, in what ways? What, what have you been surprised or impressed? I mean, what if, what, why do you think it's changed your mind or your, your thoughts concerning this? I think it's much more detailed when you're trying to mark your book. Yeah. Book. So, so which of the... read over, you know, I just this has to tell my God I've heard this a million times in my life. And yes. Really yes. See, the, I, I, am, I have found the same thing as I've been going through this. I'm like, how did I not see this last time? Some of these nuances. I mean, do you remember last week when we looked at how Jacob trembled violently? Yeah. And when we were done really looking at the word study on that, that that wasn't talking about fear. He wasn't fearful, or, and he wasn't, oh, no, I'm sorry, he was fearful. He wasn't angry like like Esau was angry, you know, he wants to kill his brother. Um, Rebecca was fearful, I think, because of all that had transpired, and she was worried about her son Jacob and, and Esau for that matter, right? Why, do, why was she worried about both Jacob and Esau? Well, because if Esau, if Esau kills Jacob, mm -hmm. then a blood avenger would have been returned for it, yeah, but would come, the family member would come. And yes. Then, Right, the blood avenger thing was what that was really all about, and it doesn't say that in the text, but when you slow down and you do your research on what's going on there, why would she be worried about Esau dying or Esau not being safe, you know, because she thought she would lose them both in one day, so to speak, meaning about the one day event, that because if one was murdered by his brother, then, then that brother Esau, he, someone would avenge uh, Jacob's death by killing Esau. So that's the blood avenger. What do you know about the blood avenger now, having retalked it through? And, how, and do you see things differently about that subject at this point? Go ahead. Well, I'm just, I'm just wondering, had you ever connected that subject of blood avenger to something like this story? No, I hadn't either. So we're all in the same boat on that one. I mean, I was like, oh, that's the blood avenger. Oh, my gosh. And I read it, 
in something I was, because when I did my word studies, my word studies took me to another word, and it was a word I'd never heard before. And so then I looked that word up, and, it, and when the definition of it was blood avenger, I went, oh, I know blood avenger. Yes. Jesus is our blood avenger, right? Yes. We know that in the last days, what we studied in Revelation is that God will, Christ himself is our blood avenger. He will avenge the bloods of the saints upon the world upon the unbelieving world who are attacking us and who who come at us. So and also, the city. And also there was that yeah. sanctuary city and also thing. The sanctuary city. Yes. <laughs> so you kind of get it's almost like you can get into a, another So this is why three chapters and actually it should have been five chapters in one week's homework. Crazy. Crazy, crazy, right? So, not that I'm calling priests up crazy. Don't misunderstand me. <laughs> but I do think it's it's a tad bit unrealistic to have tried to cover this. Fortunately, we actually ended up with three weeks to do five chapters because we had last week was a holiday, so we ended up with two weeks to do these three weeks of chapters. And I used every single drop of my time. I did not, I mean, I started in on as quickly as I could. And um, I hung in there. And as it is, I mean, I've got pages and pages of notes, and we probably won't get to all of it. So let's go ahead and just dive in and uh, see what we can come up with. Oh, you mentioned, did he think he was going to be there for 27 years? Yeah, right. Well, here in, what is it, uh, chapter 27, verse um, Yeah, for a short so time. Stay yeah. with him a few days until you're yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, yeah. Cynthia. You are absolutely just for a few days. Son, go up to my family, and while you're there, pick up a wife and come back. You know, yeah, yeah like like drive through McDonald's, right? Yeah. Yeah. Say hi. Yeah, right. Exactly. Hey, hey to all the old people, and exactly. I thought he passed away while he was gone. He was on his deathbed, 27 death years. Okay, now this is interesting. You have already looked ahead. See, I don't do that <laughs> because, in a way, I probably should because then I would know what's coming and I might be forewarned <laughs> and forearmed. But I know you have to go find the other. The tw we know there's twelve, so we're missing one yet. Yeah. Right? Exactly. Exactly. Well, I did. No, no, we didn't. No. Joseph, yeah, I've even got I've even got my little clip art of Joseph with his coat of many colors on, just so I would catch that. But yeah, no Benjamin yet. So, and I think that ha that does that might happen in the next chapter on the way back. Yeah, he's born on the way back. On the way back, and she dies. Right. Okay. Spoiler alert. And who nursed him? That's the they're all right exactly they're all they're all pregnant and having babies you know it, uh, even that's another subject that we can go into you know we have a world and especially our generation more than than yours Megan I think yours is, is starting to kind of go back the other way but where in my generation you know women should should have a career they should go outside of the home and get invested in that and they didn't really honor or respect women as mothers in in the generation that I grew up in um, with, that, which is one of the things that when we moved to Turkey and lived there, I was so pleased because in the Turkish culture, they still really honor the, the childbearing woman. And anywhere I went with my two little kids in tow, oh, chuchuklar, oh, la, la, yeah, they would go on and on. That's the same way I felt in Greece. Yes, so exactly. I, I felt like I escaped the pressure to have a career. Just Yes, yes, a wife and a mom. And one of the things that would happen to me there is when I would go to, to get bread at the bread, you know, they have fresh bread bakeries there. Oh, I wish we had them in America. And you, you stand in line, and as they're taking them out of the oven, then they, you know, bring them over. To, so you, pick, you buy your bread fresh every single day. The bread doesn't last. It doesn't have preservatives, which is nice. It's the best bread ever. But when I would show up a as a woman, and these people, after a while, they got to know me because they knew, I, and I would bring the kids sometimes, but usually I went alone. They would escort me to the front of the line. And they did that not just for, at first I thought, oh, that's really sweet. They're doing that for me. No, they do it for every woman that they know is going to go home and cook dinner for her husband. <laughs> so it's really a, a, 
a respect there and, a, and an honoring of a woman's role in their society as the homemaker and the cook. And, and so if there are guys standing in line for bread, they let the women go first because they have to be physically home cooking. I thought that was really cool. Okay, that's a sidetrack. Let's, let's go back to Genesis 29. Okay, so we got a lot to cover in Genesis 29, so let's dig in here. All right, um, open up your observation worksheets. Start with that. How many of you, have you uh, finished your at-a-glance charts? Have you been keeping up? I hope so. At-a-glance charts, you know, you have a, a list here. All you're trying to do is keep your titles up to date on your at-a-glance chart so that when we're done with Genesis, you're, you've got a completed flow of thought. And what is interesting is this at-a-glance chart becomes for you s somewhat what is similar to what we do in our each of our chapter observations, where in our chapters we go in and we paragraph title, right? But with your chapter titles, it's all that's in that one chapter in one bullet statement. So your one bullet statement needs to convey what on the whole dominates that subject in that particular chapter. So, you know, we have seen so far, you know, God created heaven and earth. We got it, right? God made man in his image. Man sinned and death entered into creation. Got it? I mean, do you see what I'm saying? One bullet statement and, and you, oh yeah, I know that's, that's what that chapter is about. So we're all the way down now into 29. Uh, what did you title 29? What's your bullet? Oh, there you go. That'll work. Jacob marries two daughters Jacob of Laban. Laban for two wives. Jacob, uh huh, Laban. for two wives. Same thing. It works the same. Very good. Any others? Yeah. <laughs> you and I are on one. We're simpatico. That was mine. Jacob marries Leah and Rachel, and I put Leah first because she was the first wife. And, and, you know, she, he, who did he love? He loved Rachel. But what happened? He got tricked. So let's talk about that. Uh, the, uh, verses one, uh, 1 to 3 starts us off. Because where we lo left off last week was Jacob had deceived his father for that blessing. Then the father was uncovered father realized what he did then what did the father do what did Isaac do for Jacob Bef he, actually blessed him. he actually blessed him do you did you notice there's two blessings he blessed him and then he blessed him again because the second time he understood who he was blessing did you notice the attitude change of Isaac the second time round he is now on board with God's prophetic word that the uh, the older shall serve the younger and he now gives that blessing wholeheartedly. And then what does he do with his son after that? Because of his conversation with Rebecca. Sends him away. Sends him. Why does he send him away? To get a wife. To get a wife. So pre predominantly to get a wife. Now, we all, at this point, would you say that, you, that we all um, understand the divine work in what's going on here as opposed to the mess that might have caused it. I mean, we know that he ran for his life, literally, because Esau was threatening him. And Rebecca was really worried that, that uh, Esau was going to kill Jacob. So she is worried, wants to send him off. But what is the divine work in this? Yes, to get a, a wife from the bloodline of Seth and Abraham, right? The righteous bloodline, so that this... this uh, lineage of blessing, the blessing bloodline, will continue as it should through a equally yoked marriage. What had Esau done? Yeah, and who did he marry? Um, he married two Canaanites. When he saw that this displeased his father, because he overhears him speaking, right, what did he then go and do? Who did he marry a third time, the third wife? Ishmael's family. Oh, that was a brilliant idea, right? What was the problem with Ishmael's family? Was he the blessing bloodline? Nope. 
your son shall not inherit with my son, right? And he was sent off. So, and it's, this is not to be perceived as a casting off in a negative way, but rather a, a dividing. It's, it's like separating sheep from goats, so to speak, not in a negative connotation, but that God was saying, this is the bloodline through which I'm going to work. This one needs to be separated, right? This is why when God called Israel as a nation, he said, you are a separate people, a holy nation. What, and how does that translate for us as Christians? What are we? First Peter. Well, yes, Romans. Pardon? Yes, and we are also a holy nation, a people of unto God, right? So Israel was the first holy nation. They were the nation of God. Now we're the nation of Christ. We're the priests unto Christ, right? And so as, a, as our holy priesthood begins in the New Testament as the church, we also are called to be a holy and separate nation. Does that mean we can leave the world? Does it mean we shun the world and treat them badly? No, it does not. It means that, however, what? What are, what's expected of us as a separated people? Be light and salt. There you go, light and salt in the world. So just keep that in mind. I don't want to ever leave you all with the idea of a, of a, or a thought line that, well, it's us versus them, and that's a negative thing. No, God is separating the peoples. He, he sends Ishmael away because he has a, a specific divine purpose for, um, uh, in this case, it was Isaac's lineage. Now it's gone to Jacob's lineage, right? And so Jacob now has to do the same thing, make sure that he stays a separated people, a holy people. So he went to get an equally yoked wife. So he's now at this point, one through three, what is he doing? Where is he going? <laughs> yeah, he traveled to Haran or Adam Paran, or whatever is later revealed to us, to Haran, or to the east, you could say also. That's in 1 through 3. Now, what is it in 4 to 12? You see, I'm going to try to move through some of these things that are not super important in detail. Let's just keep moving. What's the next verse, 4 to 8? Yeah, he does inquire about Laban. And in, in the conclusion of 4 to 8, what has occurred? He met Rachel. That's basically, that's it. Jacob, Jacob meets Rachel. 4 to 8. Well, if you... I know. You know what? So do I always, which is why some... I mean, even my list here and my list here are different. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Listen, mine are not, and mine are not necessary. I really, really want to impress on you guys. Just because these are my titles, all I'm doing is trying to help people see the flow of thought. And in totality, do you think that, that his meeting Laban is the main emphasis or his meeting Rachel is the main emphasis? Rachel. It's meeting Rachel because what are we looking for? What is our title about? Jacob meets Leah and Rachel, right? Since it's about him going to get wives, then what you know is you're trying to keep your focus on that as your totality. That's how these always work. You're, you get a title, what, you know, after you've kind of looked at the picture on the whole, right? You, and you do that by saying on the whole what's going on in here, right? You whittle it down to one major point. That's your title. Then what happens is each paragraph supports that title. Are you following me? Okay, so that hopefully that you understand that system. Are you, you're well, I said, well, you know, Rachel and said all the paragraphs are not. So yeah, that's where I have to Oh, I'm sorry, you're right. I did four to twelve. Yeah, sorry. You're right. You could break the the paragraphs down smaller too if you wanted to. In, in the so four to eight, it would have been what? L yeah, uh, yes, okay, so because he's going to figure out who his family member is, so he, he, he inquires about Laban. How important is that to the storyline? Right yes, yeah, right, am I in the right place? <laughs> exactly, and 
why might that be significant in the, in the storyline of who is God and who is man? What has God just done for uh, Jacob, who's wandering literally in that direction, yeah. but he doesn't know where he's going? It shows him where to go. Yeah, it shows you that God was guiding his steps, right? That he actually took him exactly to the place he needed to be. It was exactly the right spot. Do you remember the story when uh, Abraham sent his servant to go get a uh, a wife for Isaac, same thing. He wandered around. He said, who are you and what are you, you know, what family are you associated with? Oh, praise God. God has led me exactly. And he, he literally says in the text, God has led me. You can probably, and I didn't do it, but you could probably go back to that verse, bring it forward as a cross reference, because that is in fact what exactly happened in four to eight. So if you broke down four to eight, which is where her bullets are, so you definitely could have done that. You can put that in there. And then in 9 then to 12 is the part where Jacob meets Rachel, right? right. Okay, good. All right, so then the next one is uh, 13 and 14. Uh, say it again. Jacob meets Rachel. Yes, and when Laban uh, uh, meets him, what is the cohesive thing? What is the most important quality about him having met Laban? Yes, that he was family. And why was that significant to the storyline? He's looking for the bloodline, right? So he says Laban welcomes Jacob as family. Somewhere along those lines. Because that's the, the most important part of that piece is his family, right? He's looking for the bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. He's looking for the Seth or the Abrahamic bloodline. Yes? Well, it is along those lines as well, because what you want is you, uh, it doesn't have to do with the blood though, does it, really? It ha does have to do with what? You, what are you looking to be able to be equally yoked? Faith. The faith part, right? Right, but so, and you learn later have all You're right. I was hoping this would, uh, well, if that's shocking to you, then what about Rachel? What does Rachel do? She steals his idols. Yeah. So, I why? I, I researched that. Oh, okay. So it has to do with the fact that that, um, that whoever has the fam the household idol yeah. is the heir, and she was trying to provide oh, Jacob to oh. be the heir of the bond. So it was paired off. Oh. I did not know that. Didn't it say that she brought it back? She came back and with she this with this idol. Then she was entitled. I did connect the fact that it had to do with the idol was specifically a family household idol, but I did not know that the one who possessed the family idol is the one who possessed the family bloodline uh, blessing or posterity inheritance or whatever. It was an ancient Near East custom. Got it. I think that's why Laban was so needed it back. So well, why he was like, why did you take it? Why well, and the thing is, see, Laban should pass that on to... Well, it should have probably gone to his firstborn son. But interesting that that's connected there. Okay, so Kristen fi figures out then that the idol, her stealing the idol, has to do with the posterity or the inheritance, so to speak, of that Laban's bloodline then following with Jacob because now it's in the possession of Rachel. Um, that changes my attitude about why Rachel took it or what I was kind of thinking about Rachel. For me, I was looking at Rachel as not being all that spiritual, but, but with Leah, we're going to see there's a distinction there w between Rachel and Leah in the way they're described. But knowing that in, is an interesting twist on well, things.
see what I mean? No. So if she has the idol, if she wants to come back home. And take everything. She can't. But now she can't. That does add a little different twist on the covenant as well. Okay, get mitzpah. We'll get to mitzpah in a bit. We'll talk about that. That's in two more chapters. Okay, uh, if we get there. Okay, so, but we're doing pretty good. We're all the way halfway down here. Okay, so Laban welcomes Jacob and his family. We know that's significant. Now, what does Jacob do in 15 to 20? Yeah, he does. And uh, so in, in, in the custom then of the Near East and of that time, what had Jacob done in order to secure Rachel? Well, he, came for about a month he, he came in, he spent a month there, okay. There you go. Verse 15 says, Laban said to Jacob, because you are my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now, Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah. The name of the younger was Rachel. And now we see this statement, Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful of form and face. Now, Jacob loved Rachel. And he said, I'll serve you for seven years. I'll stay here for seven years and work with you. I find it interesting that he wanted Jacob to stay and that he felt like he needed him because he was bargaining for him to stay, right? It really sounds like he was negotiating on his part. Well, in other words, the assumption statement is you are going to stay, right? <laughs> and therefore, since you're going to stay, should you do it for nothing? And he says, okay, well, let's negotiate. So what we see here is in the negotiation for a marriage proposal. The marriage proposal is his wages then for serving for what's going to be those seven years, which goes into 14, right? So uh, we'll put on here, for me, I put Jacob's marriage proposal. I know, isn't that truth? Okay, let me. Let's, okay, let me. Let's do that together because I did. I did look this up. So, in this, what we see in the next verse, the next paragraph is Leah comes on the scene. The first one is this is his work for wages is to, is marriage. Was that my phone? That could be my phone. Let me check it out here, guys. It shouldn't be me. But somebody's talking to us. It had to. It might have been your. Yeah, and a series picks up everything. That's the. That's. That's the evil government spying on us. Maybe they'll learn something in Bible study today. <laughs> okay, 21 to 25. It wasn't my phone. At least I'm glad for that. Okay, in this part, although he has a marriage proposal for Rachel, he, um, when it comes time, who, who does he end up marrying? Yeah. So we have Jacob marries Leah. Uh-huh. Yep. Oh, I know. I saw that in one of my commentaries. Actually did that. They lined it up for you just piece by piece exactly. And I had already seen that there were similarities, but I didn't take the time to go through it because I knew I had a lot of other work ahead of me. So, but what happens is he ends up marrying Leah. So the most important thing about this point here has to do with the marriage, right? The fa who does he end up marrying? Leah. So what does that make Leah? First wife. First wife. How, in, how significant is that in scripture so far that we've seen? Very important. H how has marriage been defined by God? one man one woman so just by now we have some of this we've done so much in homework at this point you're ready to start coming to 
interpretations on this. So I want your analytical look then at this situation. What, what do you think Jacob should have done at this point when he found out he was deceived? Oops. Well, it wasn't my plan. This is what I wanted. I feel cheated. However, this must be God's plan. Right, exactly. Maybe. Part, yes, she does. She And Levi. Yeah, so in particular, the Judah one's important, and the Levi is the priesthood, but Judah is the bloodline to Christ, right? So... It seems like he's, he's right here at this point, he's really being stubborn about that beautiful girl he really wanted, right? And he did just spend seven years working for her, right? Dreaming so And her. dreaming about her, right? I think, no kidding, all the lust stuff that was probably in there as well. Um, so the interesting thing, though, is when we take this down to our lives, are there... Are there situations in our own lives sometimes that that has happened where we had a plan, we had a hope, we had a dream, and it didn't work out the way we wanted, but then we literally stomp our feet and insist on getting it our own way, and we do, and what is the outcome? Disaster. Usually, not not, if not disaster, at least it's not great, right? It's not, it's not as great as we thought it was going to be, right? Oh, yeah, of course, I know, of course. Marry, marry the guy that's, yeah, no, it does not happen that way. And you cannot convince any young girl that that's not, that that's not true either. No matter, because once they're in love, you can't change their mind. And I, I do think that there is um, possibility if we raise them with the mindset that is godly, right, that God says be equally yoked, make sure your parents approve, right? Because they're the ones observing and they're looking and they're watching. Uh, if you have godly parents. Now, if you don't have godly parents, don't listen necessarily to the advice of bad people. However, God has still put them in your life for a reason. You gotta listen to a degree, right? So you listen to your parents and you go to people who are spiritually mature and you allow them to give you their inputs and insights. So you don't just marry because you're in love. Um, I had a situation similar to this. I wanted to share it with you guys because it was very much like this in my husband and I's life. It really wasn't just me. It was my husband and I. We were living in Turkey, and we were about to get our next military assignment. This is common. You can request things. You get a list of two or three requests, and then you hope to get your top uh, pick, but you don't necessarily know you will. Well, we always wanted to go to Germany. We had begged to go to Germany. We thought, well, we did our dues. We went to Turkey. Well, it turned out Turkey was awesome, but we still wanted to go to Germany. And so we had asked, and then and we had asked again, and then we had asked again. And we just kept getting roadblocks in our path, and the places that we were getting sent to, H.J. did not want to go to. I mean, some of them were headquarters in D.C. and things like that, and he was like, nah, he's not political, he doesn't want to go there. Well, in the end, we kind of ended up forcing the situation and, to, and pushed and pushed. In other words, just kept requesting, kept requesting, until, guess what, they gave us Germany. The day we got to Germany, the financial market dropped for us in Germany. Everything was triple the cost. Just to buy a pizza was 100 bucks. I mean, yeah, it was so terrible. So, so it had gone from being this really great place to go where the dollar was strong, you know, against the Deutsche market. Then we got there, and then it was like, pfft. And on top of that, um, as, as beautiful as Germany was, we never really found a niche there. We never found... Uh, the friendships there that we normally find it, in our military assignments. We never really felt connected. We did get to travel, and I felt there are many, many blessings God did give us, but it wasn't the paradise we thought it was going to be. So that was an example in my personal life. When I was reading this, I went, this is it. You know, I want Rachel. I want Rachel. I want Ra I'll do anything. I want Rachel. God already gave you Leah. It's your wife. One man, one woman, that's God's design. No, I want Rachel, I work for her, I want her. And so he fulfills his week 
with his first wife and then goes straight to the second wife. Well, there's a week of the honeymoon. Yeah. That, that's it. That's you get the honeymoon. You have to consummate the marriage. There's a time of the two are allowed to basically have this private time together. They're not bothered. They're not expected to work. They're, they get vacation, so to speak, and they spend it together. And a lot of it has to do with consummation. Right. Yeah, exactly. So he, I know, exactly. <laughs> Especially once... Right. Well, so did Rachel. I mean, they, they all were in on it, right? I mean, he, he had to have been a little miffed at Rachel, too, that she got was in agreement on this, although maybe she was trumped, but still, she didn't warn him or tell him. We know that the dad was in on it, the, and, and Rachel was in on it. Rachel may not have necessarily wanted it either, but I think this was a lot of Laban because Laban was the one in charge. We all see that in the picture line. In any event, what I'm saying is we see a man who got miffed and he really wanted his way and so he demanded it and so he takes now a second wife. How do you think that's going to work out? Well, we know how it works out because we've been reading the storyline of the constant rivalry that goes on then between these two girls. One who is just heart sick because she can't win the love of her husband and then the other one who is uh, then uh, later God has his dealings with her as well. But in any event. Okay, so. Between, uh, Joseph and all his brothers. <laughs> Joseph and Joseph. Yeah. 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 So eyes were weak. Let's talk about that one. All right. So eyes were weak. And this is number 7390. How many did word studies? Come on, you guys. I just gave you a lecture last week. <laughs> I know there were. But this one, did this not intrigue everybody? Like, oh, what does that mean? Her eyes were weak. Okay. No. <laughs> well, that'll show you. <laughs> okay. They means, it means tender, delicate, soft. Um, and in the Dictionary of Biblical Languages, it, it means gentle. And then it goes on to explain what that means. It gave all kinds of, of uh, cross-references I'm going to give to you. But it's talking about attitude. Attitude uh, or behavior that is not harsh. In other words, that is respons it's kind and responsive. And sp specifically, who must you have eyes that are weak toward? Husband and above husband, God. So the cross references on this, uh, I'm just going to read a little tiny piece because I, I want to hurry along. But it says in uh, 2 Chronicles 34, 27, also in 2 Kings 22, 19, and 20, it says, Because your heart was tender, that's the weak eyes, you humbled yourself before God. Isn't that interesting? So right away what God does is he reveals to us that Rachel is the one that has the tender heart towards God. But what is, our, I mean, Leah, Leah has the tender heart towards God. But what does uh, Rachel have? She's beautiful. So it's the external versus the internal. Does the form of face mean external? Did you look that up? Um, when it says Rachel was beautiful of form and face. I didn't know, but I think I assumed, because as soon as I looked up the tender eyes and found out it was talking about the heart more than anything else, it was a contrast between her heart versus Rachel's heart. That's how I read that. Um, but if you find anything else out, let me know. Um, and so and then the other thing that's important to know about this first wife is that just by way of noting it, that Judah is, uh, will come from her. And that's be important to us because of what we understand about God's design for marriage being one man and one woman, and therefore what is... Now, specifically, how is it when we get there, what, how is it that she has these babies, but what about 
uh, Rachel. She's barren. Oh, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Very interesting. You've got to think that through and say, well, what's going on there? Why would, she, why would God cause w one to be barren, the one he loves the most, which you know he's spending the most time with, versus the other, and yet what's going on there? Okay, now let's move to 26. Sure. I know, another seven. Right. <laughs> yeah. I know exactly. <laughs> well, I guess okay. So here we are. Who is man? <laughs> it's all about the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh, right? <laughs> okay. So in 26 to 30, then what we see is Jacob gets married again, right? Now we see Jacob. Hmm. I've got to have an eraser because I can't spell. Oh, I know. Well, we're not there yet, but you are right. Mary's Rebecca. Now, this is basically just one week later. He's allowed to marry her and then serve the seven years, as opposed to the first arrangement where he had to serve the seven and then attain the marriage. He got the one week with that wife, then he marries the other, has his second wife while he's working for another seven years. Pardon? Thank you. Because I. Rachel. This one R. This one R, and we'll fill in with one. You guys, I can't keep those two women apart in my head. I'm so sad. I'm so sorry. I don't mean to mess you guys up, but. Just follow me. <laughs> okay, 31 to 55, or 35. Um, now we have the, the, what has occurred here. Leah Gisbert. Yeah, Leah Gisbert. I can remember Leah's name. <laughs> Leah has four sons. Now, I'm not going to write these things up here, but I did go in and do the word studies on all those sons. How, so what is Reuben? Reuben is her first. Behold, a son. All right. And, and then she goes on to say, behold, a son, because why? The, okay, so the Lord has seen her affliction. What does that tell you about what's going on in her marriage then, even at this point? She's carried a child for nine months. She's been married for a period of time long enough to conceive. But what's going on between her and Jacob? There's no love, right? There's, there's, my, and surely my husband will love me. Yes, he is. Even, he's married to her and he still likes her. Um, all right, now <laughs> we're going to get into some interesting storylines when we get into these men. Okay, Simeon, what is his name? Yeah. He heard. And in this context, he's heard what? I am not loved by my husband, right? So I, I, I used to think these, these names were a little more spiritual than this, but it's almost very earthly in her thinking. She's just, she is all consumed about the fact that she is an unloved wife. Uh, Levi means what? Attached, attached or joined to. And uh, consider, considering the word attached, what is she speaking of? Now my husband will become attached to me because I have born three sons. That perfect number again, right? <laughs> Just attached. <laughs> if he'll yeah. just like me a little, it'd be great. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you know, it's really sad because I do think there are women who are in loveless marriages, and boy, would they relate to to Leah and her heart in this. This is very sad, and it really makes me angry with Jacob in this case because, I, I mean, I don't know that he didn't care for her. I mean, I think he treated her fine. He probably wasn't mean to her, but. 
more. And that's what, that's the word that caught me too. So it's like the, there are different kinds of love though. There's a familia, the family kind of love. And I think that's how he really saw her. She is part of my family. I love her. I love Laban. I love, you know, even though Laban's not a very nice person. Okay, and Judah is the fourth child, right? Mm -hmm. And it means? Praised, yes. Do you guys remember when we did Daniel and we talked about Judah from the tribe of Judah? And the contrast in there, I had something to do with um, the two worlds of the two kinds of gods that were going on with Nebuchadnezzar and then with him. And we talked about Judah and the word Judah meant to throw praise. Literally, it's not just praise. It means to throw praise. So he's, she says now with this fourth child, she seems to be reconciling a little bit with things. And what does she say here? This time I will praise the Lord. This time I will praise the Lord. Um, Yes. And so yeah. then from that point forward, any child she births herself, well, the others are like, it's always like, it's, um, I will praise the Lord. God has given me my wages. God has endowed me with this gift. You know, it's all about God and the things we need to do. Yeah. yeah. As, she's got, as she gets older, she, yep. she stops hoping for something she's never going to get, mm -hmm. and she settles for God's love, yeah. and, which is a, a far better love because it's a secure love. Yes. Yes. And now her womb is closed. Now, this is an important part of this storyline, though, guys, because one of the things that we are seeing in here is how wombs are opened and wombs are closed, right? And we know that this is who's doing? God. Okay. So at this point, she stops bearing. Um, it, it is curious why at this point she stops bearing, um, but it will become a temporal thing. Right, my one of my thoughts though is because we'll get into the next chapter 30 where we're ready to go now. We've gone through this first chapter pretty quick, but we got a lot more to talk about here. But when we move into the next part, what is it that she ne negotiates with Rachel for later? A sleepover, with a sleepover with husband. So, do you suppose her requiring to negotiate for marital? Um, privileges, <laughs> polite way of putting it, has anything to do with why she, she also may have stopped bearing? They just yeah. were not spending yeah. enough time together. <laughs> that, I mean, the next part where we see anything that has to do with their, their relationship, yeah, she's now praising God, so she's starting to, to learn to find her love um, through God rather than through her husband. She, now, I think she's starting to come to a reality check that she's never really going to win his love. Um, but her womb has been closed, but it may not necessarily all been because God closed it, although I think certainly it has some to do with it, certainly. I mean, because God is the sovereign over the womb. But the next, the next part of that in chapter 30 is she has to negotiate for marital rights. Oh, she runs out to the field. Oh, I bought you. <laughs> You're mine. <laughs> right? So that makes me wonder if there wasn't a whole lot of... Well, and I think if you get to the end, there's a lot of stuff about the marriage that I went down the rabbit hole. Me too. <laughs> you know, it's an aphrodisiac. Yeah. And so she was... So her eldest was trying to get her child dead. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So Maybe, although this, this, the son is the one who found him and brought him to her, so it was a gift to her. But then she negotiated with Rachel, so Rachel was buying them. Rachel wanted them so she would become fertile. Well, yes, but it looks like um, some of the commentary I was reading, it looks like maybe she ended up with his mother. Maybe. Uh, to open, then her open her womb. To open her womb. Maybe. Yeah, that makes sense. That kind of it so could be. Both could be. Yeah, but what do we see, therefore, at this point, then, concerning the relationships of these women and where they found their value in that time and culture? Having babies. Having babies. As long as you're 
as you're producing babies, don't forget that, Megan, have lots and lots of babies. <laughs> the more babies, the better. We, we want more. I'm, 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 I'm an advocate for Luann. Uh, more grandbabies, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, but it is going to become a temporal thing, which is good. Hold on, my throat's bothering me again. <clears throat> I get choked up there. Okay, so let's, let's move on to 30. <laughs> Are there any other things in 30, I mean, uh, 29, though, that we need to discuss? I should ask that question. Yes. 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 And usually there's a very large dowry that goes with this, but what this shows you is dad did not have anything to give the wife, the girls as dowry, so he gave them these slave girls instead. Uh, and this was a big Hurrian, H-U-R-R-I-N custom because this area of the world was under the Hurrian Empire. Oh, interesting. So I dug around in there and I'll try to find it all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I found that too. And yes, that is why I love the fact that we had two weeks to kind of do this because there is so much more. I guarantee you there's more in here than we've even begun to touch. Even though inductive Bible study can be real detailed and can take a lot of time, it is an absolute fact. The more you put into it, the more you will get out of it. And if all you do is superficially answer her questions and move on, that's old that's old school Bible study. That's what you get if you go to other kinds of studies. But if you want to do inductive study and really get the richness of God's word, you have to put the hours in. <laughs> and it can take some time. And sometimes you do a lot of reading. I, I did a quite a bit of reading in my new commentary, which was awesome, by the way. Thank you very much. And um, also in a book called The Names of God. And I was just reading through it. And it's such a good book. Um, and in the end, I didn't really find any, ah, oh, that's awesome, you know, it was stuff we already knew. Um, but sometimes you spend a lot of time and you don't produce a lot, but other times you're like, wow, and there were some real good things in the other chapters I found. Uh, tell me the name of the book again. Um, I know, I can't remember the... Uh, Fruken Burger? Fru we'll get it for you. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to send it to Kristen, but it's yeah. a very good commentary. It's on the book of Genesis, and the guy, and it's really literally a expository teaching line by line on what's going on there. And, um, you know, Fruits and Berm. Yes, Andy Wood's mentor. Yes, it's, it's, so it's from the Jewish perspective, because he's got that background, he knows all these cool things. So there's a lot of things, and I can't say that, um, there were a couple of things in there when I read them, I'm like, ah, I'm not sure, he's stretching a little, but that's okay. However, um, that's how God uses all of us. We all have our own little insights and thoughts, and I love that God does that for us, because we need one another that way, right? Um, um, my dear friend I always refer to, <laughs> who's not with me anymore, but she was, has always been really good at scouring the internet for articles, for links to different uh, uh, like sermons or whatever, and she often has the most profound questions too. Her mind just works different than mine. And so the, to me, that's super important because that's what we're all about. I need you guys and you need me and I need you, right? And we all need Jesus and the Holy Spirit to make it all make sense. So that's what inductive study can do for you. Okay, so any other thoughts on chapter 29? Okay, my stomach's growling. Hmm. Um, I'm looking to see if there's anything in my little notes. I, I fill my page up, as you guys know. I, Oh, there was one thing I wanted you to see. I loved this. Verse um, 10. Do you remember the part here where Jacob me is first meeting Rachel? Mm -hmm. And they're meeting at the well, and there's this big discussion. I mean, you could also go down a rabbit trail on how do you take care of animals, you know, animal husbandry. Yeah, look up wells. Yeah, you look up Which well. well was it based on yeah, you words? can go into the well thing or into the sheep and how do you tend them or whatever. Well, he, he was 
baffled by the fact that they were sitting there in the heat of the day. Rather than out grazing the animals, they were waiting for water, which is crazy, right? But why were they waiting for water? There was a heavy stone on No, it's not Levon's well. It belongs to the community. But what did it say? That They says, we cannot until all the flocks are gathered and they roll the stone from the mouth of the well, meaning they needed a lot of guys to move that stone. Because what? why? The stone was what? Heavy. So what does Jacob do? He gets one look at Rachel. Woo-hoo. Watch this. And what does he do? All by himself. He moves that very heavy stone. What does that tell you about Jacob? Do you remember last week I told you how a lot of the pastors talk about mama's boy Jacob. He likes to, to cook and hang out at the tent. This guy just picked up a stone that all these guys sitting around are waiting for help to move the stone. He just picked up a stone and moved it off that well and helped them water all those animals all by himself. And all, all I could... Right, apparently, yeah. But I just left, I thought, for, so I saw two things here. Number one, Jacob is very, very strong. He's a strong dude. And number two, he's a show off. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay, this is very big custom in the Middle East. It's a on the cheek. Because later he kisses Laban. <laughs> it's just a kiss of greeting. It's not a kiss on the. It's not a passion kiss. Well, when I used to be at Disney, there's a little cross reference to remind yourself when you get to the best land of God. Yeah. It wasn't a little guy. Was no <laughs> kidding. No, <laughs> no, absolutely. But I just that caught my eye because of what I had looked at before, where they were. A lot of these pastors are downplaying how Jacob is such a. A mama's boy and I'm going he is not a mama's boy he he just proved himself he's a very strong very virile man capable of moving a stone that several men who however many men were gathered there with the women herders as well there may have only been two or three of them but they weren't strong enough to move it alone Jacob shows up and does and I just thought that was a little side note that was cool okay good progression we're doing it <laughs> okay and our title, let's write the title down here again. Um, this was Jacob marries Leah. And if you wanted to, instead of Leah and Rachel, you, sh you could see Leah then Rachel. I kind of like that better now that I've thought about it for just five seconds because that to me is a significant point. Should this marriage with Ra Rachel, okay, that's the right name, <laughs> I had to double check, is this name, is, is this marriage with Rachel, should this have ever happened? It really should not have. He should have said, the providence of God intervened, I am now married to Leah, I should have been content with that. I should recognize and be obedient and compliant to God's standard, one man, one woman, and be good with it. You know, that could even apply then later with people who think they should just keep getting divorced and remarried, divorced and remarried. No, be happy with the wife that you, of your youth, right? Stay married. Okay. All right. Now, that's never greener. <laughs> okay. Now, I br broke down the next couple of chapters into very large chunks and then gave subpoints underneath because if you wanted to, you could put together verses 1 through 13 and then 14 to 24 and then 25 to 43. So you'd really only have three paragraphs if you wanted, okay? okay? But so, and the reason I'm bringing this up is, again, to, to demonstrate to you there are different ways to do paragraphing. It, it's all about how detailed do you want to be, how much do you want to see for yourself when you go back and look at your observation worksheets. Your observation worksheet uh, paragraphs are there to help you see where you are in the storyline and some of the important points that are being brought out in that story. We know though on the whole what is Genesis 30 all about? What's happening in chapter 30 to Jacob? Or for Jacob, I don't know how you want to say that. He is. So he, 
So his, almost 12, at the end of it, we've got almost all 12 kids here. So Jacob's family is growing, right? Is there any significant point, though, that's brought out also in the storyline along that? The son of the three children that the church had abused. Okay. Okay, that's just one point, though. Is that the only point in here about oh. the, what happened before that? What's going on between the two sisters? Well, this rivalry and they use the word wrestling which I thought was interesting because of what will happen later with Jacob when he has to wrestle right he has to wrestle for the affection of God in a, in a so to speak if you want to make a comparison right I mean it's obviously God's love is always abundant and he's he longs to bring people into salvation but I do think he, God's making a point there that uh, he had a wife who was wrestling for his affection all those years. And so God is now, you know, making him basically have to go through a wrestling of sorts himself. I think that's interesting. Okay. Not just two wives, they're two sisters. They're sisters <laughs> who's broken up their they relation. With each other anyway. <laughs> right, right. They may very likely have a, have a, a you know, well, we know their personalities are very different. Yeah. One is a tender hearted one, the other one's a diva. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, let's so thinking on that, on the whole, what we're looking at then is Jacob's family is growing and there's rivalry in it, right? It has to do with rivalry and growing of his family. So, we're going to we'll title that at the end here. Let's start with 1 and 2 then and break it down. The first two verses um these are, these are 1 through 13. These verses that we're going to break down right now, these are about the wrestlings of Jacob's wives, right? A and what the result is of that. So what happens in 1 and 2? Ra what happens with Rachel? <laughs> so Rachel is infertile. Now I had to use, add that word because it's not in the text, but that's just, you could say she can't have a baby, okay? And she's barren. There you go. Rachel is barren. And who does, what's going on? She's demanding that Jacob give her the baby, like it's his fault. Yeah. And she blames Jacob. That's interesting. I wonder how much attention this girl could possibly get. So what does Jacob's re reply to her? And I'm going to put this note up here because I do think this point is really important. In here. What does Jacob say? Yeah, he does become angry. It's that same anger word that we had for Cain and Abel and all that stuff. Yeah. And what does he remind her at this point about? It's God that does this, right? So what does this tell you about what Jacob knows about wombs? That God is in control of the womb. How important is that going to be to the rest of the storyline that follows this? Right? Because we're going to get into a storyline about the wombs of sheep later, or goats, right? Oh, right. right now we've got uh, the, wa the womb of his wife. But Jacob reminds her it is God who is sovereign over the wombs. He opens and closes. Wombs, I think I'll put it over here. To save some space. Okay, so that's a significant point I do think that you have to kind of bring out in the storyline, even though it's not necessarily a title for that segment because the storyline is about what's going on in the life of Jacob here. But I think that is a profound thought that if you don't have it on your observation worksheet anywhere, may either highlight that verse in some way. I just colored it with orange on mine. So so that I could see that it, it is God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb. Because he, he is recognizing that God is the one who is sovereign over wombs. Now, he seems to have forgotten that a little bit when we get to the next part, but eventually God's going to make that known to him. Um, and uh, I, I went to, on my rabbit trail to Deuteronomy 28, specifically in verse 11. It says there, God will bless you in the offspring of your body, your beasts and your produce. So it expounds it for us in Deuteronomy 28 when he's making this uh, covenant with Israel as a nation and he says, if you'll obey me, I'm gonna, I am going to bless the fruit of your womb, not loom, 
womb, <laughs> fruit, of the, fruit of your womb, the feet of the human race. I'm going to give the womb of your animals yes. produce. I'm going to give the land produce. So God is the one who, basically, if you want to restate it, this, it is God. It says, I bring death and I give life. I am the author of life and death. I am the sovereign over that. No one else. And it will not matter what your tricks are because we're going to get into a little trick down here in a second. Now, you can, you can apply these, these medicinal things, and there's nothing wrong with doing that if that's going to help your health and it's going to improve your odds, right? But, but believing that that's your salvation and that God's the one and that that, that is the thing that is going to give you a, a baby in the womb is a false hope, right? It, who do we know is the author is God. And that's what uh, Jacob seems to know that fundamentally. And that's an important point to get into. In Genesis 20, 17 and 18, it, it has already told us uh, at that time that was um, Abimelech. And remember, he took Sarah. What did God do to his household? He closed the wombs of all those women. So you might want to put those cross references, uh, Genesis 20, 17 and 18. And then Deuteronomy 28, 11, even just those two. I, you could find lots more, but those are two that I thought were helpful when, as far as support verses for the fact that Jacob reminds her that it is God who is the one who's over the womb. Sorry. And, uh, and in Genesis, or I mean Deuteronomy 28, those first 15 verses are the blessings he promises to Israel if they will obey. Okay, that, that was that conditional covenant that God made with that nation. Okay, now what happens in 3 to 8? Yeah, there you go. Rachel gives Bella as wife, right? B-I-L-H-A-H. And basically, what kind of a move is this? Does this sound familiar to us? Yes. Who did this before? Sarah. Sarah did this when she was impatient with God concerning her son Isaac, right, that hadn't come yet. Genesis 16.3. Yep, there you go. Genesis 16.3, perfect. Okay. In desperation, basically, she does exactly what Sarah did. So she's desperate, right, um, which is understandable at this point her her older sister has outshined her by three or four children already um, and so in this case what is uh, Billa for Rachel she she's oh, her surrogate, handmaid surrogate. a surrogate she's her surrogate bearer for her children I hope she was a terror. <laughs> no, I don't really mean that. <laughs> okay. Okay. And then the next part of that, though, is Billa does what? Uh -huh. She has two sons. Right? Uh, Ra uh, Rachel. And who names them, by the way? Rachel names them. Did you notice that? So again, this shows you the surrogacy program is on, on full swing. So then she has Dan and Naphtali. All right. Do you want to know about their names real quick? Go ahead. Yes. So Dan is, um, we're, well, okay. Uh, I'm a little bit over here, but I had like some extra notes that, that in this regard of her naming, that Rachel is giving credit to God for this baby with Dan, even though it was her doing it. It's actually not mm -hmm. her. Uh -huh. so Which I love the, the names the are word. my wrestling yeah. judge and my wrestling. Well, and that actually fits in with the fact that that word wrestle and wrestlings is a key word there, right in that segment, the whole segment yeah. of uh, verses three to thirteen. And I looked that up, and it's shrewd or deceptive hmm. wrestling. Shrewd or deceptive wrestling. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, that might make sense. Shrewd meaning she's playing the game. Okay, I can play, two can play at that game. 
I'll just get my surrogate to step in for me. Yeah. What I found with my tummy was that I wrestled and won. <laughs> That's really good. I wrestled and won. So there, Leah. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'll show you. I can. T there's more than one way to skin a cat, as they say, right? <laughs> so that's exactly what's going on here. And this wrestling, how healthy is this kind of scenario? No. It's almost like the whole life of Jacob is, yeah. is it's deceiving, it's wrestling, it's, <laughs> it's lusting of the eyes and the flesh, it's, it's withholding what's due someone, it's... Um, not extending love to the first wife whom he should love. I mean, it, it, he's kind of a, he's not the pillar of a guy. I kind of had him <laughs> in my head. I was going, Jacob, yeah. Jacob I'm like, no. No, he's, you're right. Israel that is exactly the distinction, I think. You're right. I think um, it's kind of like, remember in the New Testament with the uh, John, he was the son of thunder, right? And later he's called what? The one whom love, who loves. Yeah. yeah. So what a change God can make, right? Okay, so that's 9 to 13 next. So because we've said Leah has stopped bearing children back in chapter 29, right at the close there, so now what does Leah do? Leah says, ha, huh, two can play at that game. Yeah. And that's where you know it's a complication. Yeah. Heirs have already been established. He's I know. So she gives Zilpah as wife. Yeah. And these are handmaidens, right? Poor, poor lady. She just did not want to do that. And what does Zilpah do? do? I can't spell these names. These she are. Has, she has four sons, but she's still insecure. I know. She has two more sons for her, Gad and Asher. Do we have an update on that? Do you still have your list? I have those lists too, but they're buried in my notes, so I'm really happy you did them. Oh, well, maybe it has to do with the number of kids she now has. She had four, she's got two, that gives her six. That's a troop. <laughs> Uh, and now she's beginning to be happy. I like that. So, um, okay, good. And then we've got 14 to 21 next. Now we come into this very interesting part about the mandrakes, right? Did How many of you remember the mandrakes on that movie that was out? Do you guys remember the Harry Potter movie? And they pull the mandrakes out. They all have earplugs in so they don't hear the screaming. It's hysterically funny. Not that we should be watching that show, but <laughs> but it was around when my kids were little, so <laughs> yeah. So I saw in the Living Song of Solomon seven thirteen called Love Fruit. Love Fruit, yeah. exactly. There, I got all kinds of pictures on it and there's different things. Mm -hmm. And there's all kinds of different things that the mandrake, not only the mandrake fruit is to be eaten, which I think is probably what may be what they were talking about, but the root also can be pulled up and can be ground and used for different medicinal things. So on the whole though, mandrakes on the whole, they are an aphrodisiac, they are a fertility drug, so to speak, of the time. Um, they have to do with um, uh, also health, the health of the gut, the health of all kinds of things, right? Mm -hmm. And the reason they thought that it was good, which I thought was kind of funny, is mandrake is also thought to cure female infertility because yes. its fork-shaped root resembles a, a baby. Thighs. No, oh, a woman. Thighs. Oh, that part oh, I didn't <laughs> hear. But I do know okay. that the mandrake, and I had a picture of it in my in somewhere. The mandrake root also can look like a baby. It has a rounded head, a little body with two little arms and two little legs. It looks, and in the movie I was referencing, when they pull them out, they're, ah! oh. <laughs> they're screaming like little babies. Yeah. <laughs> I know. What can you say? It's, see, these things get in my head and I can't get them out. Okay. <laughs> okay, so mandrakes. Let's talk about that then. So 41 to 21 is um, Rachel is negotiating. She, literally, she negotiates Jacob for mandrakes. Isn't that interesting? So what's interesting on this point is this means, thank you, this means that 
her sister is not getting the affection she wants, which is what I mentioned earlier, right? So it could be part of the reason she stopped bearing. Um, and then, of course, God apparently has closed her womb because it literally says that. Um, so Rachel is so desperate, and she wants to have a baby, so she wants to get her hands on this fruit, which is known at least superstitiously or for whatever reason. Um, and they actually do say these things do have some medicinal benefits. But still, it's God that opens the womb. That's the bottom line. You can do the medicinal things, but still, if God doesn't open the womb, you don't have a baby. So she has to negotiate, though, just to have time with her husband. That's really sad. So Rachel. But it's Rachel who initiates this. Rachel is the one that's negotiating. I'm sure that... Um, Leah was very happy that she had them. <laughs> Rachel negotiates. Jacob for mandrakes. And when she wins, she runs out to the field and says, you're mine, right? <laughs> I bought you for hire. You belong to me. OK. <laughs> Which doesn't seem to face him a bit. He said, OK. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> okay, mandrakes. Let's do this. Number 1736. It literally says it's used for increasing uh, desire and enhancing ver fertility. Okay, so that gives us the basics on what, what we're understanding when we look at that. What's going on there? Well, partly it's, it is uh, medicinal, but also it really doesn't have everything to do with it. I did. <laughs> there, I do. I have it on both pages. And by the way, in, the, in, in Hebrew, that word is love apples. Isn't that cool? They're love apples. They're actually a berry. But the berry is large enough that they consider it like an apple. They call them love apples. OK, now, <laughs> all right. So what is the outcome of Leah? Now, I don't know if Leah got to eat any of these herself or not. Doesn't tell us at all, right? But the outcome of this negotiation is she gets to have marital privileges with her husband, right? Which apparently have been withheld. And now, what is the outcome? Mm -hmm. Actually, she has more than that, right? Leah has two more sons and a daughter. Uh -huh. Tyre. God has given me my wages because I gave my maid to my husband, and she named him Issachar to Tyre. So what does her maid have to do with the birth of this son? I'm not sure. Does it, did anybody get time to look for that information or what that might? I just think that, oh. was, that was a sacrifice for her to give her husband her yet another wife uh, that wasn't her. That's how I look. for being generous. For one thing, you know, these maids, if they weren't given as wife, they would not necessarily ever marry, I don't think. I think they, they stayed in the house unmarried. Uh, so in one way, it would be generous to Zilpah. So but considered his wife. Now that he marries them, they are a wife, but they're a maid wife. They're, a, they're like a concubine wife, okay. right? They're not considered wife wife. Wife is what Rachel is, and wife, but real wife in God's eye is Leah. Mm -hmm. Leah is the wife wife. Rachel is a second wife. And then these other two are maid wives or, or handmaiden wives. And so, and there's literally a stat, there's, 
right, the, the traditions of man. It has to do with status and where they are. So positionally, as far as status is concerned, if, you, if the handmaiden marries their master, it does bump them up in their standing. They do get a little more privileges probably. For one thing, they've been bearing him children, right? Um, but they're still maids. They're still in that status of sort of slaves, right? Yeah. Okay. I looked up the word wages. Good. And it, um, it says prepare reward for service. I took it as reward. That he has gave me my reward. He gave me my reward. And the reward would be that she was generous enough that she wants her husband to have more children. She is generous to, to Zilpah by giving her to have a husband so that she can bear children, which gives her high value. Because what we know about women in that day, the value is if the more children you have, or even giving birth to even one child at least anyway. Remember Sarah's delight with that and how it had removed her disgrace? OK, so for these women who are maids, for them to be able to bear children also does that for them, right? OK. I mean, that's as best I know, and I didn't see anything that popped up on my um, papers or, what, or my research. But yes, that's a possibility too, yeah, yeah. Okay, now, and you know, the thing is about these maids, they never leave the house. They are there until death, so whoever's the patriarchal lead would always care for them. I mean, they would always be under their care. It would be Jacob. Well, then whoever takes the place of the patriarchal, in this case, he's got 12. <laughs> yeah, then he, one of them would be his. Okay, so now we get to 22 to 24. What is, did you notice that uh, word at the beginning of the sentence? Remember. Then, put it, put it, Put an arrow or put this. I put a clock on it then because it's a consecutive thing. First, God did these things up here with these two maids that he had children with. But then he says, God remembered who? Rachel. Rachel. Finally, Rachel is going to get her, her disgrace also removed. Then God gave Rachel a son. She just has one. The Lord, but in 2931, when you go back, let's go back to 2931. It says, now the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, and what did he do? Okay. And he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So before God had closed Rachel's womb, but now what is he doing? Now God is opening her, her womb. Now this one it can be a real um, a hard lesson for people who are barren, because what you're seeing here is God is the one who really is in control of whether we have children or don't. Not having children was felt in the old days in, under the older customs as though. It, the Lord was either displeased with them or unhappy with them or whatever, and it was considered a disgrace. Do you believe that's tr true in every situation where a woman is barren, that that means God is displeased with you or that you are a disgrace in some way or that you're not favored by God in some way? So how would you handle that in a conversation with someone? Avoid it. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's true. But I can tell you I have plenty of women who come to me on this, and I have had a very, very dear friend recently, um, I won't go, I won't give names, but she has been barren for a long time, and the Lord now has given her a child through adoption, which is great. Um, thankfully, she has, has that relief, because now she feels really fulfilled and happy. But what do you say to the woman who never is able to bear her own child? Yeah, I lost a baby. My daughter's lost twins. Most of us have lost one. Well, the same issue comes up with me and my cancer. Or yeah, why me? Why me? Yeah, is God. True. Is God angry with me? Why 
Possibly, yes. But I do think this subject of the barrenness of the womb is especially hard for women. Men don't relate. They don't get it. So there's not going to be a lot of compassion or understanding at home on the whole. I mean, they may to a degree, and they want to try to understand. They just can't. Um, not fully. I mean, they do try, though. I think men, many men have enough of a heart that they, they try. But I can remember going through a period in my life where I didn't know whether I would have a child or not because of a lost first pregnancy and the seriousness of the medical issues concerning it. And I didn't know if I would ever have a child. And I was desperate. I went to deep, deep depression. I mean, it was really, it, but I can tell you the end of that, con that wrestling in my life was my salvation. So that was a really cool outcome. I mean, God let me go through that darkness to bring me into something. But I don't know that I would tell somebody, oh, well, God will give you something really good at the <laughs> end because that's not going to put a bomb on their heart at that moment. So, so what do you think? yeah, good question. That's what I'm asking. I mean, I'm no, I have no real answer myself except that, that you do, you know, we, you, we do know the love of God, and we do know that that's the, the foundation in relationship with God. And God does not withhold good things from those he loves, right? Every good and perfect gift is from above. But there is a sovereignty of God's hand over everyone's life and a designed purpose for everyone. Um, I don't know. Okay, well, we'll move on. Think about it. Slightly different subject. Mm -hmm. I keep wrestling with the fact that we believe that Jacob could have just been happy with his first wife and not happy with other three wives. Uh huh. And yet God opened their wombs. God made them the mothers of oh, good, good generations points. Mm -hmm. that are still going on in Israel today. You know, the great twelve tribes of Israel. Yeah. Rachel, her son Joseph, saved the whole rest of the family. Uh, Judah would have died probably, and the line of Jesus would have been gone if it wasn't for Joseph, who right. came from Rachel. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and in a way, in a way, what you're saying there actually is right in line with what we would even have a conversation with a woman who is barren. What is going on here in God's plan? What is, you know, if if we have an attitude, and I even I before my salvation always had an attitude. I grew up in the church. I always knew God was sovereign over life and death, mm -hmm. and that was why I was so mad at God, mm -hmm. because you you are the one that's sovereign over life and death, and you allowed me to lose this child, and so I was. I am never speaking to you again. That's what I told him. And here I am. <laughs> so what did he do? He what? saved me and made me a teacher. Yeah. So now I get to talk every day about <laughs> Sorry, Lord. He, he, I'm sure he's laughed his belly off, you know, when he heard me say that. But that was because I understood that. So what is God doing? I mean... Thank you. He does work all things together for so good. If, if, if Jacob, I would imagine if Jacob had only stopped and didn't marry Rachel, Rachel would have been married off to someone else and probably would have had kids. Yeah. How many you of know, these patriarchs, how many of our patriarchs have had more than one wife so far? <laughs> A lot of them. And what's going to happen with David and Solomon and some of these others down the line? I know. So what does that tell you about how God operates within the realm of human systems. He uses us in spite of our Thank you. That was the word exactly I wanted you to say. In spite of ourselves, he still works out his his goals, his his design plan and purposes. We can do absolutely nothing to thwart the work of God. Nothing. So don't ever take that guilt upon yourself that says, I messed up, I did this wrong, they'll never get saved because of me. That's not true. Even, even if you do mess something up, God can make it for good. He will make it for good. And his, what, what is so awesome about our God is because he's sovereign and because he's outside of time and space, he sees the end before the beginning. He knows every day. What does it say in Psalm um, 139? He knit us together in our mother's womb. He knew every one of our days before even one of them came to fruition. So God looks at our lives at the end looking back and he allows our free will to operate. 
He, he allows Jacob to make some bad choices. He allows Jacob to even be in his st the stubbornness of his own heart towards Leah. He allows Leah and Rachel to be at odds with one another. But in the end, all of this is, as I said before, the way the girls are wrestling with one another, the way Jacob had to even deceive in order to get that first blessing to begin with and then had to flee and is gone for 27 years, all these things God knew. And God is going to use them in spite of Jacob and in spite of Isaac and in spite of Abraham, who threw his wife under the bus numerous times, right? God, in spite of our weaknesses as individual Christian believers today, in this world today, he works through our messes, through broken vessels, and he accomplishes his purposes in each one of us. And what's amazing to me is how every single life matters to God. Isn't that an amazing thing? It, you may think you're insignificant in your part or your work or your ministry or your marriage or your family, whatever it is. You may feel insignificant and even unloved to some degree by certain people in your life. But God works through the mess to accomplish his will. If you will submit to him, if you will, if you will wrestle for his love. Uh, this precept, inductive Bible study, is wrestling. <laughs> this is work. But this wrestling pays off big. Uh, you know, what is it that's going to get us through these end times that we are approaching right now that we're really in? When we start seeing the oppression of the government really come against God's people as the scripture has taught us that in the end times you won't sell or uh, buy or sell without a mark right now that's not going to be us obviously but the world's going to be in that and what's going to help them get through that is their knowledge of the word of God if they know what they're up against and they know what what's coming for forewarned is forearmed right yeah. okay 15 minutes to get through th another chapter and a half. Uh, 25 to 43, what do we see Jacob do here? He negotiates again, right? For what? Wages, literally wages. He negotiates for wages because up to this point, has he gotten any money? Has he gotten any profit other than wives and children? So he's now at a point where Laban wants him to stay. He wants to go home. He feels the call of God, uh, and he says, no, I want to return home. In 25 and 26, he says, I want to re return home. G uh, give me my wives and my children for me to for you yourselves know my service, which I have rendered you. He feels like he's done his dues, but, but there he stands, and all he has is a bunch of hungry mouths to feed and nothing to take care of his own family with because Laban has never given him anything beyond the wives, okay? And later, he's gonna, Laban's going to say, these are my children and my, right. my wife, my daughters. And yeah, I mean, he's going to, I know, yeah. So, so Jacob is now negotiating. He wants to return home in 25 and 26, right? Um, he negotiates for a fair and honest wage, correct? What does Laban do? I'm just going to put a couple of points on here for you. Well, Laban's trying to set him up for failure. Yep. Laban literally cheats him. It says that later. Yeah. That uses that word cheese. He cheats again. Because I looked up about um, ghosts and stuff. Uh huh. Because I was like, all right, what is happening all here? But um, so normally, goats in particular are usually animals black or dark brown. Mm -hmm. um, and so then Jacob gets started on his, you know, the wages are going to be the spotted and the speckled and whatever, and Laban sends him and gives them basically a flock that is unspotted, unspeckled, unstriped with all solid. I know. So Go. first he says, okay, you're going to get them as your, as your wages, right? Mm -hmm. And he probably assumed in his head they would just remain in the flock and they would just keep mating and they would have more. And No. What, is, what does Laban do? He takes out all the spotted ones, sends them three days travel away. Now the only ones that are left at present in the, in the herd are all solid. So it has nothing to do 
So he has nothing to start with. Absolutely nothing to start with. How unfair was that, right? But what happens in the, in the end of it with Jacob? Jacob prospered. Yeah, he exceedingly yeah. prospers, right? He prospered. Yeah, I know it. It, it. it just shows you the character of Laban and wh what he was working with there. Stay. He, wants, he wants Jacob to stay. Yes. He has nothing else to stay. Well, but it's um, not only, no, with Laban, I'm pretty sure it's greed. And if you go back to Rebecca, when he sees Rebecca coming, the first thing he notices is she's got all the things hanging on. Oh, oh that's right. right. Well, remember, when we get forward in 31, he actually says to him, basically, you didn't have anything when I showed up, yeah. right? I can't remember where that verse is. But he's, he's giving an account of, uh, this is what it was like when I showed up. You had nothing. And I brought you this and this and the sweat of my brow and late nights and cold days and hot, hot days and cold nights. Hmm? Right, after the hunt for the idol. Right. Yeah, yeah. But he literally gives him, let me see if I can find it. Um, oh, where is it? I'm looking for the part where he says what he did for Laban. Okay, Laban replies, I'm in 43 of 31, my daughters are, they are my daughters, they're my children, they're, and the flocks are my flocks, everything you see, it's all mine, <laughs> right? But then he wants to make this covenant with him. Okay, there was that. Um, uh, I can't find it right now, but I'll, I'll, we'll get to it in a second here. I'm sure it'll come up again. But literally, he says, I'm going to recant to you what you did to me. Right when Laban find, when he catches up with Jacob out there in the wilderness, and he says, "Look, I did this and this and this," um, and, but God didn't let you touch me. Thank you. In thirty-one, thirty-eight. Okay. Thirty-six, thirty-seven. Oh, there you go. These 20 years I have been with you. Your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried, nor have I eaten the rams of your flock. That which was torn of beasts I did not bring to you. I bore the loss of it by myself. You required it of my hand, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. Thus, I was by day, the heat consumed me, the frost by night, and my uh, sleep fled from my eyes. These 20 years... I have been in your household. I have served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flock, and you changed my wages 10 times. If the God of my, fa of my father, the God of Abraham, the fear of Isaac, meaning the God Isaac feared, had not been for me, surely now you would have, been, you would have sent me away empty-handed. Um, but there was another place in here somewhere. It says that literally, I got here and you had nothing. And now you have all this, right? Okay. So in 37 to 38, though, let's talk about that little spot right there. Um, this is where we see him taking the fresh rods of the poplar, the almond, and the plane trees. This, this one little two verses here is so badly interpreted by many uh, commentaries. So when you go to commentaries, make yourself a note to, to read it with a grain of salt and make sure you check everything that's being said in there. There's a lot of superstitions that they believe were relied upon, which I don't believe is true. Um, I believe Jacob knew exactly what he was doing. Um, but the way that it reads, it almost reads like he's believing that the way he peeled something and put it before their eyes is what caused them to have these striped animals, these spotted animals. That is not what it is saying, just so you know that. So it says, when Jacob took fresh almonds of poplar and almonds and plane trees and peeled white stripes in them, this is the important part, highlight it on your page, exposing the white, okay? Which, which was in the rods. In other words, this was an herbal medicine. 
He was exposing the, the medicinal quality in those plants so that when they were dropped in the water, the water would become uh, medicinal for the animals. Th this kind of medicine did everything. It treated all kinds of things that has to do with the womb, had to do with urinary tract infections, had to do with certain nutrients and vitamins, but all of it was to give these animals good health, right? Uh, he set the rods which he had peeled in front of the flocks, just meaning in the gutters, so that they would be attracted, they would go in that direction, but also in the gutters, just meaning that is where they went to drink. So he was strategic about where he placed them so that when they would come there, they would be drinking water that was treated, okay? It's like taking your daily vitamins. Even in the watering troughs, where the troughs came to drink. Uh, by the way, I looked at that word troughs and what was the other word? There's another word that's just like it, and they're, they're the same. Oh, gutters, the word gutters. Gutters and troughs are the same word. They're just synonyms. Where the flocks came to drink. They mated when they came to drink. Well, that's normal. Animals come to drink, and while the girls are got their head buried in water, the guys come up behind and, you know, yeah. do their thing. Okay. So that's all that's talking about there. It's just talking about the medicinal treatment of the water, okay? It's prenatal treatment, but it's also good for health on the whole. Even the males would benefit from it because they would be healthier also. It's called animal husbandry, right? Or er herbology, that's another way they call it. Um, so because they were coming in, they were mating, right? He was encouraging the mating. There was actually selective uh, uh, breeding going on, and if you get to the next part of it. Moreover, not only that, not only did he do that, but also whenever the stronger of the flock were mating, Jacob would place those rods in their sight. In other words, he would make sure those strong animals got the medicinal medicine. But when the weaker ones came in, he didn't, he didn't want them breeding. Why not? Same reason we don't breed weak cows or weak horses. We, we breed the strong ones, yeah. right? We let the, the weak ones be slaughtered and we eat them, right? Well, we who like animal meat. And I lost it. You need to send it to okay. me again. Just because I was interested in herbology, I got down the rabbit hole of the expression because God doesn't necessarily make you like this. He kind of he works with the system he's created in mm -hmm. humans. And so they have discovered that it's called the Adelphi gene and it determines the color of an animal and so what happens is if it's turned slightly on, then you have that speckled or spotted, so the genes that are on the leaf just will make part of it a different color in that cell. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of, and it's done based on nutrition and mm -hmm. what they're eating. Right, that's exactly right. And so I knew that. Like, it's all about the diet of the mother to determine right. what's going on. So when Jacob's doing his thing, God is doing his so thing. So how do you think Jacob knew to do that? Okay, thank you. One or the other or both, right? It's a combination of God probably saying, hey, Jacob, remember when you were younger and you saw the herb, these uh, shepherds doing these things to treat their animals? And he probably reminded him of that. And who initially taught humanity to know which herbs to do different things with? God. God started with Adam and Eve in the garden teaching them these things. And all through humanity, God has, has many, if you think about how many dreams we've even looked at here, just pertaining to the, the lineage part of life. But how many times has God probably brought a dream to somebody in the night and explained in their dream how certain things needed to be done in order to make it either safer or healthier or stronger, or maybe even in the early parts of of humanity, where God literally was walking with man still, he literally told them, you need this herb and this herb and this herb, and these are good for you, right? I mean, so God instructs us and experience te teaches us. So this is what Jacob was doing. None of this was hocus pocus. None of this was superstition. But that is the thing that seems to get thrown out there in a lot of conversations. And if you hear a pastor preaching on this in that manner, just smile politely and listen, and then you know turn it off later because you know that what's going on here is herbology, medicinal yeah. medicine, and God probably taught them, and and their human experiences taught them. Oh, I'm just curious. I, I don't know. Are they questioning these people? I'm mm -hmm. just curious what they're saying. I, I well, they they're talking about the the 
the stripes that were literally cut in it put in front of the animals will cause them to have these striped babies. Does that even make sense? Yeah. It kind of, we call it magic. Like magic. Like, like, like he, was, no. he was doing no. divination or those yeah. kinds of things. But they won't say that. They'll just say that it was, a, that it was the stripes that, that caused the animal to be striped. No, he was exposing the bark to, to medicinally treat the water. And once you hear that, you go, oh, well, of course, that makes sense, right? So what I thought in the dream, the angel of the Lord says, comes to Jacob in a dream, in Jacob says, here I am, and as God said, I think he, verse 12, he said, I think this is the angel of the Lord saying, lift up now your eyes and see that all the male goats that are mating are striped, speckled, and mottled. Yeah. We're not there yet, but yes. Okay, go ahead. Seen all that Laban has been doing to you. Mm -hmm. I felt like that was the angel of the Lord saying, I did the strike. Yes, of course it is. Absolutely, that's what he's saying. Yes. God is showing Jacob in that dream. Hey, Jacob, that was me that did that. Yeah. I did that. Because. It's science, but God works through Right. Science. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Too, because when the wages were changing, it had to be whatever the wages were. Right. If it's going to be. And that is supernatural work of God. That's God, right? Only God can do that. And God was doing it in favor of Jacob so that he got the majority of the, the positive outcomes. His wages would increase, and God would do the switching back and forth on that. So the medicinal part of this storyline, though, I think in a way it is showing us, again, because we're in the book of beginnings. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth, and then we're getting to see every little piece as we move along. How did man know about covenant? How did man know about the shedding of blood, this forgiveness of sin? How does God, man know about one man, one woman? How does God know, man know about being equally yoked? All these things are being taught to us right here in Genesis. Well, here's one that shows us about medicinal values, and God's not shunning them. He's not saying don't do them. He, I think he even encouraged him either through a dream or a, a remembrance. He brought it to mind so he remembered, oh yeah, I remember when they used to do this. And so he did these things that he knew to do. So in other words, what do you see in that then concerning our lives with God, our daily walks with God? We do our part, but... But in the end, it's really God. But does that negate or give you a pass to not even do your part? It's a, it's a little bit like that question asked to Paul, well, then should we sin all the more? Since it's all grace, let's just sin. No, <laughs> may it never be, right? You've been, you've been by faith brought into a life of righteousness through the righteous Savior. And you are to live that life to the best of your ability. Will you do it perfectly? No, you will fail. These medicinal things won't do 100% for you, but you still do them. I still go to the doctor when I'm sick. I go have surgery if I need it. But who's the real healer? I am standing here, literally standing here today because God healed me. I was so sick, you guys have no idea how close to death I, I actually came. I had infection in the bones and that were up toward my brain, and I had... 50 hyperbaric chamber treatments. I had eight sinus surgeries. I mean, I was really, I, I, it's a miracle I'm standing here. He obviously is not done with me yet. No. I'm very tired though, Lord. <laughs> However, I am, and, and I'm very healthy now. So this is again, another demonstration of that. We do our part, we take the medicine, we see the doctor, we do whatever, the mandrakes, fine. Eat the mandrakes, hope it works. But guess what? It's God who opens and closes wombs. Well, opening and closing wombs is what we're seeing right here, too, in this. This is the account of these animals that are bearing babies. And who is in charge of those wombs? We see it's God because you get stripes when he needs stripes. You get spots when he needs spots. And it goes back and forth. Don't shoot the messenger. When it is 11 o'clock. Okay, so 43. Okay, so we didn't get to 31. I can, I can walk through this very quickly. There's not as much in 31, though, as there was in this one. Um, Even though it's incredibly long. Very long. It's a very long thing. But basically, the whole thing is a, let's title this one back here first. And, and let me just wrap it up, because I think I can, OK? Because you've done the work, so you've got the, the flow of this. This is, I titled it In Rivalry. 
Jacob's family grows. He leaves. Yeah, that's true. Well, and that's one of my paragraphs in 43. Let's see, did I get to the end? <laughs> he prospered anyway. Yeah, that was a miraculous thing. He contends. He leaves. Uh, but 31 actually is the leaving part, so I just left it for the next part. Uh, Genesis 31, then. Let's do this next part real quick. Verse 30 was the one we were looking for. For you had little before I came. There you go. Thank you. 31, and that's what chapter? 30, 30, 31. You had little when I came. Chapter 30, verse 30. 30, 30. Okay, thank you. You had little when I came, and now you got a lot. You got a whole lot more than when I came. Okay, Genesis 31, what we see here is 1 to 13. God calls Jacob to return home. This is when my um, big titles are going to come in handy. 14 to 16, Rachel and Leah agree to go with him, right? Bye, Megan. See, you bet. Uh, agree to go. And then 17 to 21, Jacob flees, right? And so far, do we have any issues that we need to talk through? Okay, I didn't think so. And he does it without telling Laban. That's why I was thinking I would actually get through this, but... We already talked about the idol. Right. Stole the idol... Uh, so we got the picture on the idol. Okay, then 23 to 32 is Laban is in hot pursuit. Yeah, that's part of the <laughs> sub points on this. He heart, partly he hotly per, pursues Jacob, but it, I put in sub points on that then. 22, God warns him. What is he actually warning him to do? Yeah. Yeah, so basically he does not want him to interfere with his journey. That's basically what he's wanting him to do. Basically, don't tell him you have to stay or, or even you have to give me back my wife, my daughters. You have to give me back. Don't negotiate with him. You just simply don't interfere with his journey. He's on his way home. And he needs to take with him all the things that he has because he does need to have something to start with when he goes, right? So Laban hotly pursues Jacob there in, in those. God warns him. On, and this is the part that was funny is in 25 to 32 where uh, Laban acts like he was so wronged, right? Yeah. He didn't get to say goodbye. I and I put, like, wah, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> or ha, one or the other. Um, but La Laban had hotly pursued. Now, I looked that word up. It means to persecute, inflamed, to hunt down with intent of capture or oppression. So that was his attitude before the visit from God in a dream. But now what? And starting after that. Hot pursuit, now he's showing fear of God. Because he comes right down. I mean, he, he's still mad, and he still voices his opinion about things. He lets him know, these are mine, this is what I, I see in this, right? He shows, but he's starting to show a fear of God in that verse 20, 29. He says, uh, let's see, where am I, 31, 29. It is my power to do you harm. But <laughs> the God of your father spoke to me last night saying, be careful not to speak either good or bad to Jacob. So he gets it. He's going, okay, I've seen. First of all, what has Laban just seen happen with the animals? 
God has done a miracle. This is absolutely a miraculous thing. And if you don't catch that, go back and write in there, this is the miraculous work of God. And anybody looking at it has to confess that because they do not switch that quickly back and forth. But we do know if this is also a period of time. So he, at the beginning of this, he had been there 20 years. So we're probably now, at, I think, another seven years have gone by when he's breeding these animals and building his own personal wealth. Um, but he's literally saying, you know, God told me not to do one or the other. And so he's actually learning his lesson on this. He's seen what God has done. He's seen God protecting Jacob. He's seen God protecting, uh, pro producing things for him. He understands he's benefited from that because of Jacob. That's why he wants him to stay. And so now he's actually submitting a little bit. Now, how do we know that? Well, what happens in 36? Or well, yeah, I guess we got it. That would take us to 35. All right. Let's go to 36 to 42. Mm -hmm. He contends with him. You could say wrestles with Laban. <laughs> yeah. Grievances of 27 years of affliction and toil, repeatedly cheated by Laban. But God had been protecting Jacob. Now, Laban has to know that. Laban is now fully aware at this point. He has, number one, seen the outcome of the flocks. Number two, God has spoken to him in a dream. It, and we see that, that referenced in two verses, right? Then it says, now, what is the result? What does Laban do? He's, because he's in fear of God, what? What does he want? What does he want Jacob to do? Make a covenant, yeah. So, Jay, let's go uh, 40. And I just write this shit. Yeah. Got in your corner. Um, 43 to 44. Now, Laban, you could put fearing God seeks covenant. because that's the motivator here. He wouldn't have come to this on his own. Now we've got 45 to 55. That takes us to the end. Now they make that covenant, right? Laban and Jacob make a covenant or made covenant. And we went over about 10 minutes, but I think we got cl pretty close to the end. I love the names of those places. Uh, Jagar Shabuda, <laughs> it means a witness heap. Gal Galead, it means rocky region. It just physically describes the location. And Mitzpah, now I love the word Mitzpah. I do want to say a little bit about that. What did you learn about Mitzpah? Watchtower. Watchtower, okay. And literally, what does he say about it in verse 49? Never want to watch between you and me. Okay, so... What kind of, now some churches use that as a doxology. <laughs> May the Lord watch between me and thee when we are absent one from another. How do you feel about that? No! It does not mean something good. <laughs> yes, it's basically, it is a covenant that was made between two men. Uh, that is going to hold both men accountable for the way that they treat one another or don't treat one another, right? So Laban has made this covenant. Now, I just made myself a little short note. It's on your chart that you're going to get. But here, let me just read this real quick. Covenant practices, making vows, right, before God and men as well. Men have to be witnesses. Setting up signs as a witness. We see them doing that here. And these are for reminders, so that when they see the heap, it's a reminder, right? Shedding the blood of an animal. How do you think they ate that meal together? They had to kill an animal, the shedding of blood. That's part of covenant making. All common practices, it is God who watches over covenants, right? We all understand that, right? Why? Because these are promises sealed by bloodshed, and they are by nature gods. Who who instituted that whole concept of making a promise in Genesis 3? This is what I'm going to do for you. This is what I'm going to do to you, Satan. This is what I'm going to do to you, Eve. This is what I'm going to do for you, Adam. But ultimately, it's the seed that's the big, the big one. And God sealed it by doing what? Shedding of blood and 
covering them, which is symbolic picture of who's covering. Who's our covering? Jesus. Jesus. Whose blood? Jesus. Jesus. So the whole thing, covenants belong to God, and he watches over them. If you break a covenant, God is watching. And so promises are sealed by bloodshed. They are God's by nature. He will judge if a vow is broken. Laban could not be trusted, right? Although he's the one that initiates, he's not trusting Jacob. Because I think you're right about the statue thing. Now that I know about the, uh, the idols, that the idea that Jacob might try to go back and... and secure Laban's things for himself. He doesn't need them, but Laban thinks he does, right? But Laban's going to very soon find out his money's going to dwindle on that side of the heap. On this side of the heap, Jacob is going to continue to abound, right? But Laban is going to struggle because I doubt that he knows how to really take care of himself there. Um, It says, um, but these covenants between men and nations were often used to ensure peace where distrust existed. I just want you to know that covenants between man and man, nations and nations, are usually based on distrust, okay? And therefore, it's a way of securing that both parties will do what they say. And it used to be both parties had fear of God. But sadly, today, we make treaties that probably are worthless. I thought it was interesting that his, his kinsmen were included in the meal. Yes, so yes, that those are your witnesses, right? Those are the witnesses of the covenant. And they eat of it also. But also the sons can't cross over. Well, yeah, because it's, it's ab- absolutely, it's between, basically it's between two nations, yeah. Laban and his family, and now Jacob, and Jacob is the one who's eventually going to be his own nation. Mm-hmm. But it's the same nation promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as we go along. Okay, thank you guys for hanging in. We are about 15 minutes over, but we did pretty good for three yeah. chapters. Yeah. Not bad. Right. Nice work. Thank you. See you guys. I know, me either. (laughs) I wasn't sure I'd be able to do it, but we did.